بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد So as a quick quick recap of what we covered last week Sadaqa, charity, is due upon every single joint that you have You have 360 joints And there's a sadaqa that's due upon that blessing, that favor of having a joint Sadaqa, as far as the recipient of the sadaqa is concerned The one upon whom the sadaqa is given Like for example, sadaqa upon the poor, sadaqa upon the, uh, the orphan Sadaqa, as far as the recipient is concerned it can be divided into two broad categories. What are they? Qasira, limited sadaqa, restricted sadaqa, meaning, yeah, sadaqa upon you. You are giving the charity upon yourself. And the other one, mutaaddiya, the one that is mutaaddiya, transitive, or where the benefit of the charity. Somebody else gets the benefit of it. So could you give me, could you, who can give some examples of sadaqah, qasira, limited charity, namaz, prayer, salah, what else? Fasting, tasbih, dhikr, acts of worship, yes. Reading Quran, very good. Acts of worship that you engage in, that is sadaqah upon yourself. If you perform acts of worship, that there could suffice for the sadaqah that needs to be uh, given because of your joints. Sadaqah muta'addiyah. Who can give some examples of sadaqah muta'addiyah? Huh? Pushing a car. Pushing a car. Ah. Sheikh Abul Harith, you remember this one, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, smiling in the face of your brother. Yes. Removing a harmful object from the road, yeah? You don't want to remove every single object. Maybe it's been put there for a reason. Removing a harmful object from the road. Pushing a car meaning if someone's broken down, you get out of your car and you push their car. You stretch your muscles before you do so, Ikhwan. Huh? Okay. Tamam. Ba'da dhalika, Ikhwan. Sadaqah, it can be divided as far as the types of sadaqah is concerned into categories. Types of sadaqah can be divided into categories. Before we've divided sadaqah as far as the recipient of the sadaqah uh, is concerned. Now let's divide sadaqah as far as the actual type of sadaqah is concerned. So what are those types? Qawliya, fi'liya. Qawliya, fi'liya. Speech-based sadaqah and action-based sadaqah. Sadaqah that emanates and comes from your tongue. And sadaqah that comes from your limbs. Uh, who can give us an example of sadaqah qawliya? Uh, sorry? Dhikr, yes? Kalima tayyibah. Good, good word. Huh? Advice, very good, mashaAllah. Who can give us uh, a mithal of sadaqah fi'liya? Physical. Physical action that you do, which is a sadaqah. It's not, there's not... Uh, Fasting, yeah? Removing something from the road? Prayer, yeah? Anything else? Helping someone with a car. Smiling, yeah? Can you think of one where both is combined? Ah, as we mentioned last week. Helping someone, get, getting on the horse, or getting to their car. Fantastic, Yahya, Hassan. Islah, Ben, Utnin. Bringing about reconciliation between two people that are disputing. We also mentioned last week that the scholars they have mentioned when explaining this matter of ta'dilu bayna thanayn. Bringing about reconciliation between two people. Can any person just enter into a dispute and bring about rectification? No. The fact that it is sadaqah to bring about rectification between two people that are disputing does not mean that me and you and anybody can just enter into the dispute and try to bring about rectification, saying, my niyyah is pure. 
I want nothing but good between these two people. No. You have to have the ability to do so. You have to have the ability to bring about rectification. Many a times a people want to bring about rectification between two disputing parties. But they end up bringing about fitna. They end up bring, bringing about more fitna, more facade, more turmoil, more tribulation as a result of his reconciliation. So therefore, the scholars they mention, the one that enters into bringing about islah, rectification between two people that are disputing or two parties that are disputing, he needs to have the ability to do so. He needs to know that I'm in a position to be able to do so. Those two parties, perhaps they have no respect for what I say anyhow. So when I enter upon uh, the, uh, the matter, it, it's going to cause more harm than good. So the point being is that the person has to have ability to do so. Tamam. So then after that we went into the, to the next hadith. The hadith of Al-Nawas ibn Sam'an radiallahu ta'ala an. That the messenger alayhi salatu wa salam, he said, Al-birru husnul khuluq wal-ithmu ma haka fin nafs wa karihtan yitali alayhi nas. Birr, righteousness, is good manners. And ithm, sin, ithm is what causes uneasiness within the soul and you hate that other people find out about it that is one narration that Imam Bukhari, Imam and Nawi quotes here another narration that he quotes is the narration of Wabi Sa'ib ibn Ma'bad radiallahu ta'ala an who said ataytu rasulallahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqala jitta tas'ala anil birri wal ithm he says that I came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Messenger says to me you've come asking about Al-Birr and asking about Ithm you've come asking about righteousness and asking about sin قُلْتُ نَعَمْ I said yes قَالَ إِسْتَفْتِي قَلْبَكَ the Messenger said ask your heart الْبِرُّ مَطْمَأَنَّتْ إِلَيْهِ النَّفْسِ وَطْمَأَنَّ إِلَيْهِ الْقَلْبِ البر righteousness البر is what the soul is at ease with and what the heart is at ease with وَالْإِثْمُ مَا حَاكَ فِي النَّفْسِ وَتَرَدَّدَ فِي الصَّدَرِ sin the messenger continues sin is what causes uneasiness in the soul and it causes this reluctance in the, in the chest even if people give you verdict and they give you verdict meaning if they give you verdict upon verdict one after the other so this narration here or these two narrations Shaykhuna Shaykh Abdul Mahsin Abbad he explained it and he explained it into eight parts. He divided the explanation into eight parts. So in part number one, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abad, he is saying, yani he's mentioning the fact that the, uh, the second narration, there is some maqal, there is some kalam, there is some statements about the uh, chain of narration. However, there are other supporting narrations which uh, strengthen its, uh, its, uh, its meaning. As for the second part, البر كلمة جامعة تشمل الأمور الباطنة التي في القلب والأمور الظاهرة التي تكون على اللسان والجوارح والجوارح. What is the meaning of البر? What is the meaning of البر? The messenger said to the companion, البر is what your soul and your heart is at ease with. What is البر? Al-Bir, it is a comprehensive term. It is a collective term. It is a term that gathers and collects many things. What does it collect? Anything and everything that is good and righteous. Externally and internally. Anything and everything that is righteous, whether it be external, physical actions, statements that you make, or internal actions of the heart, beliefs that are obviously found within the heart, based within the heart. 
البر از ا كامله از ا كلمه جامعه ا كومبرهنسيف تيرم ا كوليكتيف تيرم ذات غاذرز اول جود ثينجز وذر ذي ار اكسترنال اور انترنال ا بروف اوف ذات از ا ستيتمنت اوف الله سبحانه وتعالى دي اي ان سوره البقره ليس البر ان تولوا وجوهكم to the end of the ayah righteousness is not albir is not that you turn your face east or to the west ليس البر ان تولوا وجوهكم قبل المشرق والمغرب ولكن البر من امن بالله والملائكه والكتاب والنبيين to the end of the ayah Allah he says that righteousness isn't that you faced in this direction or that direction but rather righteousness albir is and then Allah mentions to believe in Allah to believe in his angels to believe in the book to believe in the book and then after that he mentions wa atal mala ala hubbihi dhaw al qurba to the end of the ayah the one who gives his wealth in spite of his love for that wealth to his relatives to the poor people to the orphans and so on and so forth so when we look at this ayah what is the first what category do the first aspects that we mentioned in this in this ayah fall into Allah he says righteousness is not that you turn to the left uh, to the uh, east or to the west but rather righteousness is belief in Allah the angels the uh, the, the book the message what does this fall into what category does this fall into al aqidah an aqidah is it something that is from those as- aspects of khair al zahira or al batina external or internal Batina, internal. So here we can clearly see that albir, righteousness, has been in reference to something that is batin, something that is internal. And then after that, Allah, Allah he mentions, وَآتَ الْمَالَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ ذَوِ الْقُرْبَىٰ And likewise, righteousness is giving your wealth to, in spite of your love of it, to your close relatives, to the poor people, to the orphans. Okay, now, albir, Righteousness has been explained to be what? External. Physical actions. And to the end of the ayah. The different categories of righteousness. The, the, the different categories of good, uh, of khair, of goodness, has been mentioned. External and internal. And therefore, based upon that, al-bir, it is every, it is a, it is a comprehensive, it is a comprehensive term that, denotes every single thing whether external or internal tamam number three part number three the messenger he says albir this righteousness which is every righteous thing external or internal it is what he said it's husnul khuluq it is good manners Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abad, he says that this could mean that husnul khuluq, good manners, i.e. in the conventional usage of the word husnul khuluq. When a person thinks of husnul khuluq, good manners, what do you think? What do you think of? Mu'amala with other people, your interaction with other people, smiling in their face, having good thoughts, being charitable and so on and so forth. That's the conventional usage of the term when a person thinks of husnul khuluq, good manners. Who can remember what husnul khuluq with this conventional uh, usage of the term, what its pillars are? We mentioned several times, yeah, four pillars of good manners. Four pillars of husnul khuluq. Okay, so no, uh, we don't, there's no specific order. One has been mentioned, which is essentially about the tongue. Uh, use, using your tongue correctly. Using your tongue correctly. That's one. Number two. So essentially, controlling your impulses. Controlling your impulses. It could, it could be when someone has caused you to become angry, the impulse is to react in an angry manner don't act based upon that impulse but it could also be you've lost uh, some wealth your business partner is 
taken the business, he's put it on his name, he's gone off with the money. And rather than being upset, maybe you're not the type of person that becomes upset in the sense of becoming angry. You become upset the other, half, the other way. And you become resentful against the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That impulse, it's an, it's an impulse, it's an emotion. Don't react based upon that impulse of yours. That you end up becoming resentful towards the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You lose your father, you lose your son, you lose your, your mother. This is going to cause you to become upset. This is going to cause you to become struck with natural grief. That natural grief is no doubt an impulse which could result in you doing, saying things and doing things which is haram. Becoming resentful concerning the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Striking the cheeks, ripping the pockets and what have you. Don't act upon that impulse. Don't act upon that emotion there. That emotion of becoming overwhelmed with grief. Overwhelmed with sorrow. That's a second pillar of good manners. Not reacting based upon your impulses. Not being driven by your impulses. Number three. Number three. So we've covered two so far. We said there's four pillars to good manners. One, controlling your tongue. Two, not being driven by your impulses. Three. I'm tapping my nose for those who can't see. What does that denote? Uh, keeping your, uh, minding your own business, minding your own business, keeping away from those things that don't concern you. Fourthly, and lastly, we've done that one, that was number one, controlling the tongue. Number one, controlling the tongue. Number two, not being driven by your impulses. Number three, uh, minding your own business. Hasnav van. Good opinion of others. So that basically means having salamat al sadr Having a clean chest. Clean chest towards others. It's based upon that narration, yeah. yeah. So those are the pillars of good manners. And the Messenger, alayhi salatu wa salam, he said in this narration, al-bir, righteousness, and we explain what righteousness is. It's so many things. Internal, external, uh, 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 Things that are related to speech, things that are related to actions, it's so big. That the messenger says, Al-Bir, this righteousness, it is Husnul Khuluq. How? How can righteousness be good manners? Being a well mannered person. What does this mean? Shaykh Abdul Muhsin Abbad, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, he explains this to mean. يعني تفسير البر به لأهميته وعظيم شأنه. The Messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام has explained البر righteousness to mean حسن الخلق good manners meaning يعني to highlight how important good manners are. Bir, we know, is something big, something great, something that is very broad. And it has, and it's a collective term that collects so many things. But the reason why the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, has defined al-bir to be husnul khuluq, because of how great husnul khuluq is. Because of how good, how great and important good manners are. And of the great station that good manners occupies. Sometimes you may find a person, he's religious, mutadayyid, he is mustaqim, he's a practicing person. But he's got bad manners, he's got poor manners. Someone who's just become Muslim, he looks at him. This is a religious person, this is a righteous person, I don't get it. How is he religious? How is he mutadayyid? How is he a practicing person? He's got poor manners. Look at how he's just spoken to the elderly person on the street. It happens. Imagine when you started becoming a mutadayyid mustaqim person. When you started practicing. And how you would notice certain people. Perhaps you just started practicing. No beard at that time. Musbil perhaps. Just learning how to pray. New, per new to Islam. 
on you to becoming religious. But notice, if you rewind back into the past, how you would notice small things. And one of the things that you would notice is you'd see a, rel a religious person. A religious person, big beard, mashallah, he has all the sifat of zahira, all the external sifat of a practicing person. But you'd become shocked at how uh, ill-mannered this religious person is. You'd look at him and look at him, how he treats the older people. Look at him, how he abuses other people, verbally abuses other people. Look at him, how he mocks other people, how he laughs and scorns at other people. When you became practicing, if you rewind back, you would notice these small things. Why? Because the messenger said, Al-Bir Husnul Khuluq. Righteousness is good manners. If you're really righteous, if you're really pious, if you're really bar, righteous man, righteous woman, then you're going to have husnul khuluq. You're going to have good manners. You're going to have good etiquette. You're going to have good mannerisms about you. People, they look down upon this. Ah, oh, husnul khuluq. Forget it. It's a, it's a minor thing. It's not the most important thing. Yes, it's not the most, the most important thing, but it still is a very, very important thing. The most important thing is a tawheed, no doubt. But likewise, good manners, very, very important. And that's why you find the ulama encouraging us, encouraging us to learn, to study, to read those books that are on the topic of good manners. One of the, one of the scholars recently, within the past year or so, he advised this, Sheikh Rabi' ibn Hadi al-Madkhali, Hafizullah ta'ala. He advised the people of Sunnah to read the books of manners. Read Al-Adab Al-Mufrad of Imam Al-Bukhari, Sheikh Rabi'i, he said. Al-Adab Al-Mufrad of Imam Al-Bukhari, it's a book that collects, or that's on the topic of good manners. Imam Al-Bukhari dedicated this book of his just to collect those ahadith that are revolving around the topic of manners. Sheikh Rabi'i, he said, read uh, Shama'il Al-Muhammadiyya. Shama'il al muhammadiyah the characteristics of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa What he looked like, what his hair was like, what his face was like, what his eyes were like, what his chest was like, what the hair on his chest, alayhi salatu was was like. Why? Because he sallallahu alayhi wa Allah said about him, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Indeed you, Muhammad, occupy an exalted character. So you learn about this man to the extent that you learn about what he looked like because he was the best of men in character. Sheikh Rabi advises to read this book, Shema al Muhammadiyah, to read the biography of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why? Because as a result of that, not only will you follow him in the most important thing, which is belief, which is aqidah, tawheed, but likewise you'll end up following him. You won't be able to help but follow him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when you learn about him when you read about him when you find out what he looked like what he, how he walked what type of clothes he wore you won't, you won't be able to help yourself but follow him because you'll become in love with this man and when you love someone you follow him Sheikh Rabi he says to read this book and to read the biography of the messenger alayhi salatu wa because you'll end up not only following him in his beliefs but you'll also end up following him in something that is still very, very important, and that is the manners and the etiquette of, of our Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam. So this statement that the Messenger make, ma made, al-bir husnul khuluq, bir is good manners, meaning that a uh, great portion of righteousness is good manners, and that a good part of righteousness is good manners, and that, ma and that good manners is very important and very occupies a high and lofty station. This statement of the Prophet ﷺ, Shaykh Abdul Mahsin, he said, is very similar to the statement of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam when he said, Ad-Deenun Nasiha. If you think about it, the Prophet said, Ad-Deen an Nasiha. The religion is Nasiha, sincere advice. We've covered this hadith before. Ad-Deen an Nasiha. The religion is sincere advice. What did we learn? When we studied this hadith, Ad-Din al nasiha meaning an nasiha is a great portion of the deen. Giving advice, it occupies a great station in the deen. 
giving advice is something that is highly regarded in our deen. That is what that means. So when the messenger says, Al-Bir, Husnul Khuluq, Bir is good manners. It is similar to when the messenger says, Al-Deen and nasiha The religion is advice. Meaning advice is something very important in the religion. It has a big, it occupies a great portion of the religion. Another example is when the messenger said, Al-Hajj Arafah. Hajj is Arafah. Arafah. Yom Arafah, when the people are making Hajj, and when they make Dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. What does that mean? Does that mean that everything else isn't Hajj? Muzdalifah isn't Hajj. Al-Mabid fi Mina isn't Hajj. Al-Tawaf uh, 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 isn't Hajj, Al-Sa'i isn't Hajj. No, it's Hajj as well. So what does the Messenger mean when he says Al-Hajj Arafah? Hajj is Arafah. What does he mean by that? Ahsant. Uh. Arafah is a great portion of the Hajj. Yani Arafah is an important part of Hajj. The Messenger is saying that to highlight the great importance of Arafah. The messenger is saying that to show the high and lofty status of Arafah in Al-Hajj. And likewise the messenger said here, Al-Bir Husnul Khuluq. Al-Bir righteousness is good manners, meaning righteousness is a great portion of, or rather good manners is a great portion of righteousness. Good manners occupies a great station within the realm of, or good manners uh, occupies a great station within the realm of righteousness. So that's one explanation as to why the messenger said, Al-Bir Husnul Khuluq. That's one reason why the messenger explained Bir to be good manners. From another angle, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abad, he says, <coughs> from, a, from another angle, When the messenger said Husnul Khuluq, he's referring to the whole of the deen. Righteousness is goodness. Husnul Khuluq, good manners, is essentially the whole of the deen. How can Husnul Khuluq, good manners, be understood to mean the whole of the deen? Husnul Khuluq has its conventional usage good manners between human beings but in the broad sense of the word when you think of husnul khuluq good manners in the broad sense of the word then it is the whole of the deen because when you are praying to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> when you're supplicating to him when you're giving charity for him when you go to Mecca and to perform Hajj, all of that is what? Good manners to your Rabb. Good manners to your Maker, your Creator. Uh, Yunus, he does something good for me, so then I do something good to him in return. It would be bad manners if Yunus did something. He makes those nice Hungarian biscuits that he made last time. And I don't even say thank you. I just gobble them up and I go off on my thing. That's bad manners, isn't it? Good manners towards Yunus would be what? Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Or at least make him some mitai or something like that and give it to him. Huh? That would be a husnul khuluq towards Yusuf. Husnul khuluq, uh, husnul khuluq to, to Allah. What about good manners towards Allah? We've forgotten about that. Allah has given you money. Allah has given you house. Allah has given you the ability to see, the ability to hear. Allah has given you the ability to live in a place where there isn't a war. All of us are living right now in a place there, where there isn't a war. Those of us that might have seen those um, undesirable situations will be able to appreciate perhaps the ability to live in a place where there is istiqrar and aman, security and peace. Allah has given you an ample supply of oxygen and there is no fatura, there is no 
uh, receipt that خلاص, this is how much you've received of oxygen and you this is how much you need to reimburse for the oxygen that you've got it's free again and again and again go into the swimming pool and uh, and then see how valuable that oxygen is then how much you would pay just to receive a few tanks of that oxygen so Allah has given you so much what have you done for him what have you given back to him where is your gratitude to him subhanahu wa ta'ala bad manners it is bad manners it is not to pay gratitude to your Rabb Jalla wa Az bad manners it is not to do not to listen not to pay attention to what your Rabb Jalla wa Ala is asking you to do in this life and if you listen to him the benefit again goes back to you he doesn't gain any increase in benefit by you listening to him subhanahu wa ta'ala so it is husnul khuluq being a good muslim is husnul khuluq to allah being a worshipper of allah is husnul khuluq good manners to allah praying husnul khuluq to allah you go on your bed you lay down you say allahumma uh, 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 say to my kids every single night you say that every single good manners before you go to sleep read ayatul kursi good manners to allah you read uh, and you spit it in your hands you rub it on your body good manners to allah you wake up alhamdulillah good manners to allah all of this is good manners to allah you eat your food, you say, Bismillah, good manners to Allah. And therefore, you realize that the deen of Islam, in its entirety, when you, when you think about the word good manners in the broad sense of the word, the deen of Islam is nothing but good manners. Good manners to Allah, good manners to creation. So that is the reason why the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, <coughs> he explained, al-bir, to be husnul khuluq. That is the reason why he explained, Al-bir, yani righteousness, to be husnul khuluq. Part number four. Part number four. This is concerning the statement of the Messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam. Wal-ithmu ma haka fi nafsika wa karih. Then you tali alayhi nas. Al-ithm, sin, is what causes uneasiness within your soul and you hate that other people find out about it. Shaykh Abdul Muhsin, he said, that from sin are those things that are absolutely clear. You know that drinking alcohol is a sin. Absolutely clear. But then likewise, among sin, among those things that in the eyes of Allah is a sin, are those things that may not be absolutely clear to you, but they do cause uneasiness within the chest. They do cause a lack of tranquility in the soul. You do dislike other people to find out about it. You do dislike other people to find out that you've engaged in that sin, in that thing. This is similar. And why, do you, why is it the case that you dislike other people to find out about that particular, that particular matter? Because it is from those things that yustahya minhu. It is from those things that are considered shameful. It is from those things that a person shies away from doing in front of people. And it is from those things that a person, uh, he feels as though others may end up speaking about him for having engaged in that matter. It is similar. It is similar. This hadith here, this part of the hadith here, وَالْإِثْمُ مَا حَاكَ فِي النَّفْسِ وَكَرِحْتَ أَنْ يَطَلِعَ عَلَيْهِ النَّاسِ Ithm is what causes uneasiness within the soul and you hate that other people find out about it. It's similar to three ahadith. It is similar to three other ahadith uh, that we have covered before. Can anybody, anybody remember those three ahadith? Here the messenger said, sin is what causes uneasiness within yourself and you hate that other people find out about it. It's similar to three other ahadith. Who can tell us what? Any one of those three ahadith are. Ahsant. 
It's, it's uh, similar to the hadith, in al halal bayyin, in al haram bayyin. The halal is clear, the haram is clear. Up until the messenger said, فَمَنِ اتَّقَ الشُّبَهَاتِ فَقَدْ اسْتَبْرَعَ لِدِينِهِ وَعِرْضِهِ the, the one who keeps away from the shubuhat, from the dubious matters, then he has saved his deen and his, his mother, his ird, his honor. That's one hadith. Any more? Sheikh Abbas. Sorry? Aywa. إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَاسْنَعْ مَا شِئْتِ If you have no shame, do as you wish. If you have no shame, do as you wish. Meaning if a person does have some haya before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that haya, that shameness, that shyness before Allah would stop him from engaging in those things that are dubious, that he is unsure about, that cause him to become uneasy. Another hadith. Sheikh Ali said that one. We did a while ago. Leave that which uh, uh, causes you doubt for that which doesn't cause you doubt. So this statement of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, that sin is that which causes uneasiness within yourself, it is similar to those three ahadith that we have studied uh, before. Tamam, part number five. Part number five. If you notice here, in the second narration, the messenger said, when defining al-bir, he said, al-bir matma'annat ilayhi al-nafs, watma'anna ilayhi al-qalb. He said, righteousness is what the soul finds ease in and uh, what the heart finds ease in. Or righteousness is what the soul finds tranquility in and the heart finds tranquility in. Why is it the case that the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, repeated it? He said the soul finds tranquility in and the heart finds tranquility in. What does that mean? What does that imply? Okay. Is there a difference? Well, that's what I'm asking. Is, it, is there a difference? Tahir, you should know. <laughs> Affirming. Yeah, well, it's yeah, emphasizing. It is to emphasize. To this companion, that righteousness is what causes uneasiness. Uh, sorry. Righteousness is what causes you to become at ease and at peace with it in your soul. Righteousness is what causes your heart to be at ease with. There is no additional information. It's the same. Having ease in your soul, it's the same as having ease in your heart. The Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, he mentioned being uh, having ease in the heart and then mention having ease in the soul just for tawkeed for emphasis to emphasize that if you you yeah anyone he's talking to this companion not talking to anybody and everybody when he was talking to this particular companion he said righteousness is what you for definite for a surety 100 percent are at ease with that is what righteousness is and then the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam he defined al-ithm as the opposite of that. For this companion, he defined sin, the opposite of that, meaning what causes uneasiness within you, causes that, causes that agitation within you. You find an agitation, an uneasiness in your heart, uneasiness in your soul. Tamam. Inshallah ta'ala, we shall conclude at this point. I believe right now is the time. صح? Yes. So we'll conclude at this point. But just a matter of clarification. We clarified it last time as well. But just in case people weren't here last time. Um, something that's very important. Something that was being emphasized right now. Which is that the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, he said that when the companion, uh, when the messenger said, you've come to ask about righteousness, the companion said, yes. The messenger said, inquire from your heart. Ask your heart what righteousness is. Okay, so does that now mean that anybody and everybody, if we want to know what, some, what righteousness is, 
what righteousness is, what something that Allah is pleased with is, all we have to do is just feel it in our heart. Is that what it means? The Messenger said righteousness is what your soul finds ease in, what your heart finds ease in. The Messenger said, ask your heart, inquire from your heart. Ah, so does that now mean that if I want to know, is this halal, is this haram, is this ibadah or is it bid'ah? All I have to do is ask my heart. Sahih, is that right? No. What is the master for, what is the source reference for determining what is righteousness? What is the master al-asasi? The primary reference to determine, is this righteousness or is it not? Uh. Quran and Sunnah, the Sharia, the legislation. Okay, but now Sheikh Ammar is saying, Sheikh Ammar is saying that Quran and Sunnah, the Sharia, that is the source reference point. That's the legislation that we turn back to in order to determine what's righteousness and what's not. What does this mean here? What does this mean here when the Messenger is saying, seek counsel from your heart, ask your heart, inquire from your heart, ask your heart what righteousness is? How do we understand that then? Ahsan barakallahu fi. He's speaking to somebody whom he knows. He's speaking to a companion about whom he knows. He's a man of righteousness. He's a companion of mine. He's a noble companion of mine. Because if a person is righteous, if a person is a truly a righteous man, then yes, he'll naturally feel uneasy about embarking upon a certain thing when that thing in reality is a sin. There's something in his heart that is, there is something in his heart that tells him, don't do that. It's a sin. Don't approach that thing. It's wrong. Even though he hasn't come across any evidence as of yet. He may not have inquired about it. He may not have asked the scholars. But there is something in his heart, the righteous person. There is something in his heart that is telling him, don't do that. Keep away from it. There is, there is this taraddud, this reluctancy in his heart. There is this something in his heart. How do we know this? How do we know this? Because there is another narration from the Messenger There is another narration from the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam where he told us about this. He told us about this thing that a Muslim has in his heart that cautions him from embarking upon a certain thing. A thing which in the eyes of Allah is a sin but you just don't happen to know it. You don't know it's a sin but there is something in your heart that's telling you it's a sin. And that is found in the narration of the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam, recorded in the uh, sun sunan of Imam al-Nasai and the sunnah of Ima sunan of Imam um, al-Tirmidhi and likewise in the Muslim of Imam Ahmed. And it's a narration that Imam al-Albani al collects in a targhib tarheeb and he declared it to be sahih. It is the narration, and we conclude with this narration, it is the narration of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال ضرب الله مثلا صراطا مستقيما Allah has given the example of a straight path وعن جنبي الصراط سوران فيهما أبواب متفتحة and on the two sides of the صراط on the two sides of the of the path are walls a wall on this side, on the right, and a wall on the left. And the two walls have doors that are open. And upon the doors are hanging curtains. And at the head of the sirat, at the head of the path, is a da'i, is a caller, saying, be firm, or uh, stay upon the straight path. Stay upon the path and do not deviate. وَفَوْقَ ذَلِكَ دَاعٍ يَدْعُوا كُلَّمَا هَمَّا عَبْدٌ أَنْ يَفْتَحْ شَيْئًا مِنْ تِلْكَ الْأَبْوَابِ قَالَ وَيْلَكْ لَا تَفْتَحُوا 
فَإِنَّكَ إِنْ فَتَحْتَهُ تَلِجْهُ And then, above the path is another da'i, is another caller. Above the path is a caller saying, or there, there is a caller, whenever the person, whenever the person wants to open up something from those doors, then that caller at the top of the path, above the path, it says, Wailak, woe unto you. Do not open it. Because if you open it, you will end up going inside it. Thumma fassarahu. Then the Messenger alayhi salatu he explained it. So, so far, the Messenger has said, Allah has struck the example of a path. Path has two walls on the side of it. The walls have doors. The doors are opened. They have curtains hanging over them, hanging over, over the doorway. There, are, there is a caller at the head of the path. And it is saying, oh people, stay upon the straight path and don't deviate. Above the path is another caller. Whenever you want to go to that door and open that door, that caller says, woe unto you. Don't open it. If you open it, you'll get, you slip inside of it. So now the messenger explains. ثُمَّ فَسَّرَهُ فَأَخْبَرَ أَنَّ الصِّرَاطْ هُوَ الْإِسْلَامِ The messenger explained the sirat to be Islam. وَأَنَّ الْأَبْوَابَ الْمُتَفَتَّحَ مَحَارِمُ اللَّهِ And that the open doors are the prohibitions of, of Allah. Those things that Allah has made haram. وَأَنَّ السُّتُورَ الْمُرْخَى حُدُودَ اللَّهِ And that the hanging curtains are the boundaries of Allah. وَالدَّاعِ عَلَى رَأْسِ السِّرَاتِ هُوَ الْقُرْآنِ The caller at the head of the path, it is the Qur'an. Here's a shahid now. وَالدَّاعِ مِنْ فَوْقِهِ هُوَ وَاعِذُ اللَّهِ فِي قَلْبِ كُلِّ مُؤْمِنِ And the da'i, the preacher, the caller, at the, يعني above the path, he is a wa'ith, a wa'ith, an admonisher. A reminder, an admonisher, an admonisher of Allah in the heart of every believer. That therefore shows that the righteous person does have something inside of him telling him, don't do that thing, warning him, don't do that thing, even though he doesn't know whether it's halal or haram. He has not studied the matter, whether it's halal or haram, but because Allah has granted him a wa'ith, an admonisher in his heart, that is reminding him, don't approach that thing, because that thing, it is in reality haram. You just don't know it to be the case for definite. In the eyes of Allah, that is haram. This, however, as we know, doesn't apply to anybody and everybody. And we'll explain this more so next week in detail. But, khulasa, in summary, a person that is sinning again and again and again and again. A person that is obstinate in sinning and being rebellious against Allah. A person that sins against Allah in public. That type of person, is he going to have this wa'id in his heart? Is he going to have this admonisher in his heart? How is he going to have it? If it's the case that he has no problem sinning out in front of people, then how is he going to have that sensitivity in his heart? Not to sin in front of Allah in private. How is he going to have that sensitivity in his heart to pick up that this thing is a sin? And as we mentioned last week as well, as the saying goes, Kathratul imsas yuballid al ihsas. Touching something again and again, yuballid al ihsas. Touching something again and again numbs the sensation. You touch something again and again and again and again. And the sensitivity will wear off and you'll become numb to it. If it's a case that you rub your hand against something again and again and again and again and keep on doing it, the ihsas, that sensation, that feeling, that sensitivity will go. You become numb to it. Same thing applies to sin. You sin again and again and you're persistent, sinning and sinning. You sin openly, it will kill that ihsas, it will kill that sensation. You'll become desensitized to it and thus you lose out on having this feeling in your heart that warns you about sins, sins for which you might not have much evidence for. 
But we'll expound upon this inshallah ta'ala next week so that everybody has a wholesome understanding. We don't want people to walk away with a half-baked understanding. So inshallah ta'ala try to attend next week so that you have a 100% wholesome understanding of the, of the matter. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Wa sallallahu ma'ala nabiyyina Muhammad walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.